Eventually, every one of us <coughs> will have to submit to the God of the Bible. Yes. Romans chapter 14 and verse 11 says this, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Every person, no matter their nationality, no matter their language, no matter their religion, um, whether they are religious or not, and the truth is everyone is religious. The word religion comes from a, a, a Greek word that literally means worldview. Everybody has a worldview. Amen. Now, your worldview may be a, 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 it may not be spiritual, but everyone has a worldview. And whatever your worldview is, whether you believe that Jesus is real or not, whether you believe that the God of the Bible created everything or not, whether you believe that there is any such thing as a God or not, everybody is going to have to bow to the God of the Bible. The God, the worshipers of Allah right. are going to have to bow right. to the God Amen. of the Bible. Amen. Those who worship Satan will have to someday bow to the God of the Bible. Amen. Everyone is going to have to bow to the God of the Bible. Are you following me? Every knee shall bow to me, the Lord says. So with that, I want to talk to you today about this, about what John said to Herod. Now I want you to keep this in mind that John knew King or Herod the Tetrach. His name was actually Antipas. This is Herod Antipas. Oh the son of Herod the Great. He was the Tetrach, as I've read in Scripture. And if you've been following along, you know by now, the word Tetrach means ruler of the fourth part. So he was a, interestingly enough, a political man. Herod was not religious. Herod was not a Pharisee. I'll show you as we study, Herod was not a Jew. It's interesting that we would mention this because there are those who say that uh, the preacher should keep preaching and the gospel in the church. But we see John the Baptist here not preaching to a Sadducee who was a religious leader, nor a scribe who was a religious leader, nor a member of the Sanhedrin, nor an elder but to a politician, a man who was not a Jew, who was not a believer in Christ, who had not been baptized of John, and yet John applies the word of God to him. That's much different from the way we would be, we would do today. I recall a young man telling me one time that you can't witness to rich people the same way you witness to everyone else. Ron and I was talking to him and we replied, that's one gospel. That's not a gospel for the wealthy and a gospel for the poor. That's one gospel. It's not a gospel for the civilian and a gospel, a gospel for the enlisted man. There's not a gospel for the citizens, the citizenry, and a gospel for politicians. There's one gospel. And that one gospel is for everyone. John knew Herod. By the time of our text, Herod had been in power for 32 years. 
All of John's life, Herod was the teacher over uh, this fourth section, over this part of Galilee. If you look at Luke's gospel, and I pray that you will hear me as we lay this foundation. Luke's gospel chapter four, it says, and in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor over Judea and Herod being Tetrach of Galilee and his brother Philip Tetrach of Ithuria and the region of Tri Tricontris and L Lysanus the Tetrach of Abilene and, and Ananias, Ananias, excuse me, and Cephas being the high priest the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country of Jordan, preaching and baptizing, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Herod was in office when John first started his ministry. Eighteen months later, we see John before Herod. Are you following me? To add to Herod's wickedness, Herod had married his brother Philip's wife. As I aforementioned, Herod was not a Jew. His father, uh, Herod the Great, um, the father of, our, of Herod of our text, was a descendant of Esau. And you remember what the Bible says, Jacob, the father of Israel, have I loved, and Esau have I hated. So the descendants of Esau, uh, Herod the Great was an Idumean, and he was married, his wife, Malfiki, was a Samaritan. And you knew during Jesus' lifetime, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. So Herod the Great uh, uh, was an uh, Idumean of, of the descendants of Esau. His wife was a Samaritan. To that union was born Herod Antipas. So the Jews hated him on both sides of his family. And this man without any Jewish history ends up being the ruler over Galilee. Are you following me? And uh, his, his not being uh, a Jew, and he really cared nothing for them, it kind of explains the aloofness uh, that you see with him in the way that he handled our Lord. I'll preach in just a minute. But look at Luke's gospel, chapter 23. I love to hear the sound of the pages of the Bible turning. Amen. Listen at that. It's just music to my ears. That beats going to church where no one has a Bible. Look at this. Now, <clears throat> this is doing our Lord's passions. Verse 6 says, when, Her when Pilate heard of Galilee... He asked whether the man, the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him, speaking of Jesus, to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad. Notice this. He was glad to see Jesus, for he was desirous to see him for a long season because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. He was glad to see Jesus, but for him, Jesus was a sideshow, a trickster. He wanted to see Jesus perform some miracle for his entertainment. 
Then he questioned with him in many words. So Herod began to talk to Jesus. But he, Jesus, answered him nothing. Jesus answered none of Herod's questions. I really want you to hear this because God said in the Bible, all souls are mine. Am I right? That, that's Ezekiel 18 or Ezekiel 19. All souls. Jesus was God in the flesh. Am I right? Jesus was the word, according to John's gospel, chapter one, made flesh. Am I right? Jesus was a part of the creation. Am I right? Yeah. The Bible says, was, that was, without him was there not anything made that was made. Are you following me? Yeah. And yet we find Jesus who came here because God loved everybody. <laughs> Bible says, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? That he gave his only begotten son. Here is Jesus who loved everybody before Herod and he never said one word to Herod. I told you last Sunday that one of, uh, one of Herod, Herod's uh, mansions were in the land of Tiberias and Jesus never went through Tiberias even though Tiberius was next door to places like uh, 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 um, Nazareth and other lands where Jesus frequent, uh, Capernaum, the Lord Tiberius was in walking distance, but our Lord would not go to Tiberius. Our Lord had nothing to do with Herod. I don't want to be so wicked an individual that Jesus would not have anything to say to me. This is Herod questioning our Lord and the text said that Jesus answered him not a word. See, the truth is, the truth is that in many cases, the truth is improperly presented to people. We present our Lord as some begging, almost like a, a groupie. Somebody running behind you saying, please accept me, please accept me, please accept me, please accept me, please love me, please get saved, please, please, please. This, that's not the case. You can reject the Lord one time too many. You, you, can, you can go too far and the Lord not even as much as speak to you. I'm going to show you where the Lord spoke of Herod, but he never spoke to Herod. And when he spoke of Herod, it was with disdain. Jesus had nothing kind to say about Herod Antipas. And Herod is most assuredly in hell today. He's lost. You don't want to be lost. You don't want to ignore the voice of God. You don't want to say to the God of the Bible, to Jesus Christ, I don't want you. I'm grown. I'm my own man. Don't allow your position of strength and power to think that your meanness won't be checked. Herod Antipas was a mean man. He was so mean to God's people that he put, in, he put, into, he put into writing that he wanted some Jewish notables killed on the day of his funeral, on the day of his death, so that there would be weeping in Israel. For no one would weep 
at the death of Herod because he was that wicked a man. It was Herod Antipas, as we talked about this last Sunday, who killed the little babies in Bethlehem who were born round about the time of Christ's birth. Here we see that the Lord said nothing. And look at verse 10. And the chief priests and the scribes stood vehemently stood and vehemently accused him. Notice who's accusing Jesus. The religious leaders of that era. You, you find today religious leaders, preachers, arguing for lifestyles and behaviors that are contrary to scripture. We, we, they built the largest planned parenthood clinic in D.C., right in the heart of the hood, right across the street from an elementary school, and they got preachers in D.C. to go and dedicate the clinic. Now, how are you going to pray a prayer of dedication to a clinic that performs abortion? Oh my, it seems to me that the chief priests and the scribes still live. We are blessing that which God has cursed. Pulling Baptist Church downtown, a lesbian pastor performs same-sex marriages when God said that to be married, you have to be a man and a woman. We are blessing that which the Lord said is wrong. These people accuse Jesus. And look at verse 11. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught. Set him at naught literally means Herod with his soldiers began to treat our Lord with great contempt. See, when he was talking to him, Jesus knew that he wasn't sincere. When he was talking to him, Jesus knew they didn't mean what he was saying. And he treated them, and look what they did. They began to manhandle our Lord. They began to rough up our Lord. They treated him at naught, and look at this, and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe. They put a robe on him and sent him to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod, two men who couldn't stand each other, Two men who were enemies to the nth degree. On the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together. For, they, for before they were at enmity between themselves. These two wicked men began to be buddies. No wonder Jesus spoke of him, but never to him. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, tells us this. Follow me now. I pray that every man, woman, boy, and girl will listen to me. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 31 and 32 says, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, they're talking to Jesus, Get thee out. Depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. That is, Jesus, counsel your plan. Leave town. Get out of here. Because Herod is going to try and kill you. And Jesus said unto them. See, Jesus was a man. You know, if the Lord walked the earth today, the media and the people would hate him. Because he's not a punk. He was never politically correct. He told the truth and he would say it like it had to be said. He wasn't some little sister walking around with a weak voice. Oh no, Jesus Christ uh, was a man, a man's man. Uh, grew up as a carpenter's son, which is more akin to being like a lumberjack. So, you know, you have to be weak to be a Christian. You haven't met any real Christians. Christianity doesn't make you weak. Christianity, biblical Christianity, makes you strong. Amen. So they told Jesus, change your plans. You, 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 you need to get out of town because Herod is going to kill you. Jesus said unto them, go and tell that fox. 
fox there literally means insignificant person. Go tell that fox. Praise the Lord. Behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I shall be perfected. That is, he, yeah, that is, he says, no matter what Herod's plans are for me, I will not change my itinerary. I'm going to cast out devils today. I'm going to do cures today. I'm going to heal tomorrow. And I'm going to work the third day. And I'm going to finish my course. And I'll stop doing what I'm doing when I'm done. He won't change my schedule. That's why I love him. Jesus makes you strong. Not weak. Not afraid. Not constantly looking over your shoulder. Hallelujah. Tell that fox. Tell that bloody man with shady character. Tell him, praise the Lord. Tell that crafty Herod. <laughs> Glory to God. In Mark's gospel, chapter 8, you didn't know Jesus said things like that, did you? Mark's gospel, chapter 8, in verse 15. Well, 14 and 15. He says, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. So they, they, they don't have food this time. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. So they only have one loaf of bread. They're down to a loaf of bread. On the road with Jesus and down to a loaf of bread. So Jesus says to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees which is um, false religious piety, religiosity without your heart being in it, going through the motions, religious but not saved. Beware of that leaven and of the leaven of Herod. Notice, he speaks of Herod with disdain. The leaven, the leaven of the Pharisees was false religiosity. The leaven of Herod was politics. And he's not putting down the whole world of politics, but he's speaking of it in, a, in the, the, the evil of it. He says you got to beware of this leaven. And then he ended up rebuking the disciples because they thought he was talking about real bread. So is, is he saying this because we only have one loaf? Jesus said, wait a minute. When I fed 5,000, how many boxes, how many loaves did you uh, collect? They said, uh, uh, 12 baskets. He said, when I fed the 4,000, how many loaves did you take up? They said, seven baskets. He said, well, there, well, common sense ought to tell you I'm not talking about bread. Because I, I can take little. I can take nothing and make something out of it. See, our Lord, our, listen, our Lord to follow the Lord, the Lord demands something of you. Christianity, I'll say it again, is the ultimate thinking man's religion. And that explains why many do so, do, doesn't do so well. Because it demands that we apply thought to what God is doing. See, to be a believer, you, you're called up higher. That's why I love this. I love biblical Christianity. It challenges you. Praise the Lord. It'll make, you, it'll make you straighten up. Praise the Lord. Call you out of the club. Call you out of wickedness. Call you out of sin. Call you out. Call you out. He calls us out and he calls us up. Amen. Somebody ought to tell God thank you. So John speaks to Herod. Let's talk a little. Are you with me? About uh, the lady who sat by his side, let's talk about Herodias. Because John said that it is not lawful for him to have her. Barclay said, there is Herodias. As we shall see, she was 
the ruination of Herod. Now, I differ with Barclay on this. Now, uh, now she messed him up, but he was messed up when he met her. All right? Because how, how do I know he was messed up when he met her? How do I know Herod was already messed up? You know, besides killing all the babies in, in Bethlehem and, and just being a wicked man in general. You had to be messed up to be attracted to your brother's wife. Now, out of all the women in the world, how are you going to get a fixation on the one who married your brother? Now, even though I guess brothers can have similar tastes, but once, once, once there's a ring, I mean, once she chose that she ain't going with you, she's going to go with your brother. Well, you know, I mean, a regular person, just, just a normal person, unless you're Herod, a normal person. I mean, that, that battle is lost. That's, matter of fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, she ought not to be able to go with your brother. And uh, uh, if they don't make it, she still ought not to down the road hook up with you. And something like that ought to be off limits. So you did what? You kissed my brother. What? Okay. Hey, sister. Hey, auntie. Hey, grandma. You could be anything but baby. Now, some of y'all look at me like you married your brother's wife. I don't, maybe, maybe we got some kissing cousins in here today. Uh, maybe, maybe I need to stay here then. Maybe that's the problem. We got a bunch of perverts in the church. Am I right, Doc? Because you messed up. You messed up to do that. So Herod, when he saw her, <coughs> I'm preaching good. <laughs> See, and, and, and she was, I will, I will give her credit. I, I, I have some very, something nice to say about her in the end. <laughs> because she, do, she does display uh, something. She, she had a, a sense of greatness. But at the moment, we simply know that she was stained by a triple guilt. Number one. She was a woman of loose morals and of infidelity. Number two, she was a vindictive woman who nursed her wrath to keep it warm and who was out for vengeance even when she was justly condemned. Now, y'all not to be mad. If you get condemned, y'all not to be mad with the person. If they say something to you to condemn you, and you did it. See, because now if you did it, you're justly condemned. I, I'm, I want to kill him. For what? You did it. You don't, you don't want to kill yourself for doing it, right? You can live with your doing it. But you can't live with someone telling you you were wrong when you did it. But you knew you were wrong when you did it. You just, you just don't want to hear that you were wrong. But it didn't, you, it, didn't, it didn't bother you to do it. See, this is, how far can we go with this? You just don't want someone to tell you that you were wrong for doing it, even though you knew you were wrong when you did it. Now you want to kill the person who told you you were wrong for doing it. Notice where he said, she nursed her wrath. Once, 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 once Herodias, uh, once you were in her sights, it was just a matter of time. Uh, she'd get mad and stay mad. Six months later, still mad. Praise the Lord. Waiting for an opportunity to get you for what you did. Nursed her wrath. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps... The worst of all, I said triple, she was a woman who did not hesitate to use even her own daughter 
to realize her vindictive ends. John MacArthur said, Herodias is one of the most wicked and perverse women mentioned in Scripture, perhaps second only to Jezebel, although she was first beguiled by Herod. It was not long until he was being manipulated by her. You better watch who you get. So you gonna, he, he, he pulled her. I tell you what he did. I tell you what happened. He chased her until she caught him. That'll hit some of you next week. <laughs> because Herod and Herodias were already married to someone else. Their marriage to each other was doubtedly not lawful. The Holy Spirit, I talked about this, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit even refused to recognize their, her as Herod's wife, directing Matthew to refer to her, and the book of Matthew was written some 58 to 68 years later, to refer to her as her brother, his brother, Philip's wife. Although at the time when Matthew wrote and at the time when John spoke to them, she had been divorced from Philip for a number of years. The new marriage was not only unlawful, but also it was incestuous because Herodias was the daughter of Aristobulus, the half-brother of Herod, making her Herod's step-niece or Herod's niece. Isn't it amazing that, that wicked people can get in power? John said, I'm going to preach to you, it was not lawful for thee to have her. We probably won't get many amens today. Notice John didn't preach his opinion. John didn't preach his preference. John didn't preach his culture. John preached the word of God. He said it is not Bible. It is not lawful for you to have her. Not, I don't, I, I, I don't think it looks good. Because what he thinks, John's opinion is not the word of God. The word of God is right. And I hope that you allow your lives to be governed and dictated by the word of God. Notice what he said. It is not lawful. John was referencing uh, two passages of scripture that can be easily overlooked. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18. And verse 16 says, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. To uncover nakedness means to have sexual relations or to marry your brother's wife. Isn't that something? Not 50 verses. Just this one. And I'm going to show you one more. Because you know, I heard uh, 44. Since we ain't going to call the names anymore. 44 said that Paul uh, preached an obscure, from an obscure passage in Romans to uh, speak against homosexuality. Romans chapter 1. 44 called that obscure. Well, none of the Bible is obscure. The Bible is the word of God. And the Bible is right. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 21, you find these words. If a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. 
he shall he hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, and they look at this sentence shall be childless which was a sentence akin to a punishment akin to death. It was a curse. Notice verse 20 says, if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, his aunt, for the record, attendance is real good today. I'm not getting any amens. I feel like I'm preaching to some Presbyterians and some two by fours. But uh, I'm going to try to make it. Let me. He says, if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, his auntie. Some of y'all got to break, let, got, got to let that crush go now. Uh, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness and they shall bear their sin. They shall be childless. That is, he's speaking a curse on them. See, that there is saints, there is a such thing as an order. Amen. And, and the Bible warns us against sexual relations with near kin. The, the, the repercussions are terrible. Amen. Israel's greatest enemy, the children of Ammon. And the children of Mount Seir is a race of people who should have never been born. They were the people who were born to the daughters of uh, Lot after his daughters got him drunk and, and raped their father and got pregnant by their father. The, the, this is the history of a, a people who were the arch enemy of Israel. What's the point? Conse actions carry consequences. Amen. They carry consequences. Uh, and uh, in this day of unconditional love, and Jesus loves us no matter what, and there's no consequences, people are lying to you. There are consequences. And see, I'd rather tell you and warn you that there are consequences before you do some things and then suffer the consequences. And there may be consequences that may be lifelong consequences. Consequences that can affect you for the rest of your days. And you're sitting there saying to yourself, why didn't somebody warn me. John said, it is not lawful, praise the Lord, for you to have her. I pray that you allow the word of God to be a lamp to your feet and a light to your pathway. Praise the Lord. I pray that the word of God become your, your guide, hallelujah, and your compass. For if you follow God's word, God's word will bless you real good. You know, they invited John up for John to work a miracle. Herod, it is said that when he invited John, he wanted John to come and entertain him. Wanted John to come and be his uh, jester. But you know, John the Baptist was a man of God. John the Baptist was not an entertainer. He was God's man. Sold out to the Lord, governed by the Lord, filled with the Holy Ghost from the day he was born. Isn't that something? Born, filled with the Holy Ghost. He was one of only three lifelong Nazarites in all recorded scripture. John, uh, Samuel, and Samson were lifelong Nazarites. And uh, Herod made the mistake of inviting a real man of God to come before him. John walked up in there dressed differently, looking different. Praise the Lord and anointed. And uh, he looks and Herod says, perform some miracle for me. And John stands there looking at them. Herodias sitting there all dignified, waiting for a miracle. Herod sitting there in all of his glory, hated by everybody, but in power. And John opens his mouth. And you know what he does? He does the politically incorrect thing. He does, uh, he, he, John is guilty 
for wrong th thought, for thinking wrong even though he was thinking right. He told the truth. He said, it is not lawful for you to have her. And when John said that, praise the Lord, oh, Herod got so upset. But more, more importantly, Herodias got upset because Herod was by and large a lazy man given to indul indulgences and uh, didn't have much fight left in him. But Herodias, she was full of venom. And when John said what he said, she was insulted and they locked him up. Now, when he said this, follow me now, uh, they wanted to kill him. Verse 5 says, uh, and when they, when he would have put him to death, he feared the people. If you study Herod's life, because Herod didn't fear God, Herod feared everybody else. He feared the people. He feared John the Baptist. He feared uh, for his throne. He feared the military leaders and dignitaries who dined with him. He had a fear of being embarrassed because all of this fear was in his life because he didn't fear the Lord. People who fear the Lord fear nothing else because we know that because we fear the Lord. The question is the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Good God Almighty, when my enemies, even my foes, gathered around me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Let me tell you something. When you fear the Lord, you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear your enemies. The Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, it, it causes his enemies to be at peace with him. When you fear the Lord, you don't have to fear cancer. You don't have to fear sickness. I didn't say that you wouldn't get sick, but you don't have to fear it. When you fear the Lord, you don't have to fear tomorrow. Because what, what is the saying? The proverb says, I don't know what tomorrow may bring, but I know who holds tomorrow. And as long as you know who holds tomorrow, you can face tomorrow with glee and with confidence, knowing that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. John the Baptist feared the Lord. So John did not fear Herod. Herod didn't fear God. Therefore, Herod feared the people. He feared everybody. So he locked John up, but he wouldn't kill him because the people considered John to be a prophet. And uh, his wife, Herodias, remember I said she nursed her wrath. She kept it warm, waiting for an opportunity. Waiting for an opportunity, trying to get a husband. Kill him, kill him, kill him. He shouldn't have said what he said. Kill him, kill him, kill him. You have to watch some of these, I hate to say it, but you have to watch some of these spouses. They'll, they'll stand between you and God. Now, when you get married, listen, when you get saved, you, 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 you really don't get saved on the family plane. You have to get saved on your own. Now, I'm, now I'm glad that my wife is saved, and she's glad that I'm saved, but I'm saved for me, and she's saved for her. Now, if she decides she's going to leave Jesus, it would break my heart. Oh, I'd cry. I'd do everything I could to try to stop her, but I can't leave Jesus because she left Jesus, and if I decide to leave Jesus, it would break her heart, but she can't leave Jesus because I left Jesus. Praise the Lord. And I ain't leaving my church. I'm not leaving my anointing. She kept on badgering him. Kill John. Kill him. Kill him. Uh, well, honey, you know what he said was true. Kill him anyway. And uh, so finally an opportunity came. Herod's birthday. Now, you know, originally Jews did not celebrate birthday celebrations. That was strictly a pagan thing. 
pagans uh, celebrated birthdays and, and the birthdays <coughs> celebrations were filled with gluttony, drinking, erotic dancing, and sexual indulgence. So it's Herod's birthday. Herod now has invited, oh my, all of his uh, political friends, military dignitaries, and uh, the, all of the muckety muck and the high ups uh, to, the, to, to the feast. Had, they're having a, a big shindig on Herod's birthday. And uh, praise the Lord, verse 6 introduces another character. It says, but when Herodias, Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced. From the Jewish historian Josephus, we learn that her name was Salome. Yes, Herodias' daughter, Salome, uh, she was a young girl. Some say that uh, she was probably uh, somewhere, amen, around 8, uh, 12 to 14. Some 12 or 14, some put her age at 16 or 17. Either way, she was a little princess. Either way, she was Herodias' daughter that she had from her only real husband, Philip. Philip's daughter. Praise the Lord. I'm getting in deep water. And uh, Herodias, I don't know what kind of mother, would instruct her daughter mothers and fathers but mothers raise your children fathers raise your children I know that we didn't bought into the African saying and the reason we bought it it was a perfect setup number one Hillary said it Hillary and we believe anything the country stuff you know there's an African proverb Hillary African that's the connection there's an African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. All right? There's the word of God that says it takes a mother and father. Now, you go on with your village, but look, daddy, raise your children. Mother, raise your children. Praise the Lord. Uh, black man, go home. Get your family. Raise your family. The leaves on your family tree are begging you to come home. You out there in the streets trying to be a teenager. Out there hanging around with the boys. When you get children, the boys, that, that time is over. You praise your, you, your mother now. Your mother, and I'll tell you something else, mother. Single mothers, you have to be careful how you date. You can't keep bringing man after man in that child's life. It warps that child's mind. Because you're teaching them, you're teaching them. You, you, they, 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 oh, I know what I'm talking about. Because you, they break, they, they, they suffer too much heartbreak. Because they get attached to your latest bow. And then as soon as y'all break up, the, the child, all of a sudden, the man ain't talking to the child no more. Don't, don't speak to the child. Don't. So now the baby, got the, 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 the baby got to figure out how to disconnect. Then as soon as that one disconnects, here comes another one. All right, the child gives their heart to him. Then y'all break up. The, the, the baby got to figure out how to disconnect again. My God, by two or three disconnects, you got a serial killer on your hands. Let me tell you something. You see, now look, when you, you, when you come here, visitors, I'm going to tell you the truth. And see, I, many of us, see, we've been derelict of duty. Derelict. 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 This woman, this woman was wicked. She told her daughter, I want you to dance. Now, don't even think. Don't even think. Don't even think. Ballerina, don't think warts. Don't think praise. God. Don't even think the bump or the double bump. Oh no, nothing like that. It was a praise the Lord lap dance. It was a it was a sexual dance. Mother put her daughter up to get up there and drop it like his heart shake it, 
shake it, shake it, shake it. And dance and dance in front of Herod. The Bible says that it pleased Herod. That is a euphemistic that is a euphemistic statement, which means she danced, brothers, until he stood up. And I ain't talking about getting out the chair either. I'm trying to preach. I'm trying to preach to you. She danced until she turned him on. Now, a good mother would have taken her daughter. Well, a good mother would have never put her out there. And, uh, and a halfway good wife, uh, he, her husband would have known, I better not. I better not think like that about my stepdaughter. And if I do, I better not let her mother know that that's on my mind. But in this family, all that stuff was upside down. Wrong was right. Right was wrong. The only thing that mattered was getting rid of the preacher. Look at how the world is today. Folk are trying to destroy God's truth and those who preach the truth no matter what. So she sent her out there and she began to shake it. Oh my God. Everything was trembling. And Herod got turned on. Just jiggling. Herod got turned on. And he got turned on so much. So sexually aroused that he says to his brother Philip's daughter. He says to his uh, wife's, uh, Lord have mercy. I'm mixed up now. <laughs> says to her, girl, you're dancing so good that I'll give you anything you want. I'll give you anything you ask. Whatsoever you ask of me right now, you can have it. Now, you know he had to be messed up. You know he had to be messed up. You know she had to dance. And uh, that he is ready to just give it all away. You see, you, you got to keep yourself out of certain situations. And uh, Rocky, let's, let's hurry up now, Rocky. And, and so when he made her that promise, he gave her an oath and said, I promise you I will do it. And she, having been instructed by the devil, no, instructed by her mother, her mother said, my, my, you know he told her in the dark, said, my husband is no good. You know he took me from your daddy. You know your daddy is his brother. He's no good, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, get, we're gonna use him because that John the Baptist made me mad. He is good. The Bible speaks of those who are despisers of them that are good. John was good. John was right. I can't get any help in here today. Ah, uh, I ought, to, I ought to preach it for the next six months. And, uh, and so she said, he's no good. And here's what, I want, here's what I want to do. I want you to dance until you move him. Now listen, listen, you mothers. Uh, there's a lot of mix, mixed uh, marriages now and step parenting and, and all that. Now the man, praise the Lord, you, you, you need to watch him. You need to watch him around your children. You need to watch him. I, I'm, I'm trying to move on. I'm trying to help somebody. Judge, I'm trying to help somebody. You need to watch him around your children. You need to watch how he look at your children. You need to, you, and you need to tell the children, well, once they, if you get ready to bring stepdad in there, put some clothes on when you come out your room. You need to walk around, uh, praise the Lord, uh, showing everything. And it just makes for a bad atmosphere because there has to be decency and there has to be order. I wish I had a praying church and there ought to be godliness and there ought to, have, there ought to be basic standards of decency. Praise God. I don't care what people say. There is a difference between males and females. Praise the Lord. And, and, uh, and when, uh, oh, she may not even be your flesh and blood. And so you got to make sure that you ain't bringing a pervert home to be with your children. Because they'll mess your child up. And too many mothers have sided with the daddy. 
child come to him, mama, he touched me. And you, you beat the child up and side with that child and the child end up being hoish, end up being a prostitute, get her heart broken, get all messed up. Then she marries somebody. She can't be a good husband, a good wife to her husband because uh, she's messed up and she was messed up because you brought her around a Negro who was messed up and everybody's messed up. You better listen to the word of God. You better hear what God has to say. Ah, yeah. Oh, Lord. Shake somebody's hand and say, he's right. People, people have been hurt. People have been scarred. People have been abused. And they can't shake some of this stuff. Little boys have been turned out. You brought some guy and he's messed up. If you see any, you see any sissy in him. You see any broke wrist in him. You see any, any evidence, any, any. Keep on walking, keep on, keep on. Because something is wrong. And the children are too precious. The children, the children, the children. I'm, I'm fighting for the children. See, see, I fight for the born and the unborn. I'm fighting for the children. The children are too precious. They can't recuperate. They get messed up. Hallelujah. They, 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 they get traumatized. And, they, they, and, and they, 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 they grow up and they can't trust nobody. All because the person that they put trust in violated them. And there you go staying in that situation because you need a paycheck. No, you need your rump whooped because God will make a way for you. Good God Almighty, when they told Hagar that Ishmael must go, they put him out. They sent him out there in the desert by themselves. But ain't the Lord good? God went out in the desert and gave him springs in the desert and he made a way for him. I'm here to tell you today that no human being is your savior. You don't have to stay in something that's not right. God will. Lord, God will, he will provide. Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. Ah. Oh, oh yeah. So, yeah, he gave oath in Eastern times and biblical times. Oaths were considered to be uh, sacred that you couldn't violate. And, and especially if you're a potentate. So he said, whatever you want. He didn't know that, uh, that his wife, whom he wooed from his brother, boy, life will come back and get you. you st now, this is what you stole from your brother. Should have left her with, should have left her with his brother. This is what you stole. You stole a woman. Probably, probably beautiful. The text doesn't speak to her appearance. But, you know, if he saw her and stole her from her brother, I mean, I'm sure she wasn't a hag. I mean, who wants a hag, you know? So, uh, that makes sense, right? And so, brothers, does that make sense? She had, to, she, had to, she had to have something going for her. So, so, he steals her. But he steals a woman who would tell her daughter, dance till he gets sexually aroused. I know him. He's going to tell you, I'll make an oath to give you anything you want. When he does, ask for the head of John the Baptist. Another note. 
In biblical times, rulers had sole authority over their prisoners and over their servants. See, we're blessed. We've grown up in an age and in a country where we have rights. So we can't imagine this. See, we have rights. We have the Bill of Rights. These rights protect us all. This is why no matter what, we need to uphold the rule of law. Because if you get rid of the rule of law, then no one has rights. You, you women, you are protected. You're strong. You, you have all that, you know, your neck action. You can tell uh, somebody off. You know why? You have rights. I mean, he can, he can be biggest, he can be big enough, he can be a monster. He can have the physical strength to crush you, but he can't because of the rule of law. You have rights. And if he violates your rights, there's a police force and there's a jail and all that kind of stuff to protect your rights. So, but now if we go, if we, if we become a nation though, without law and a nation that doesn't adhere to the rule of law, everybody lose their rights. Now we're in a society where it's survival of the fittest. If it's survival of the fittest, a whole lot of us are dead in the water. They had no rights. So he, when he made the promise, she said, while he was turned on, give me John's head on a platter right now. It bothered him but it didn't bother him to repent. He looked around at the men at his table. And you know what he was thinking? I, li I like what the one writer said. He knew he would have looked weak to take back or violate his own oath so fast. For they heard him when he told her, because it, it was considered to be a big thing. Whatever you want. You know, he's been big, big Negro. Whatever you want, whatever you want, just tell me what you want, you can have it. She said, all right, give me John's head. And all the men at the table, all the politicians and military leaders and dignitaries, what you going to do now? Are you going to look, you going to break your word or are you going to keep it? Fearing them. I told you this word was full of fear. Fearing embarrassment. He says, go get him. And they go and they behead John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. And uh, when they bring John's head up, a gruesome sight, but what you have to understand also is that it was common. So in, 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 in their mind, in, in their culture, you know, Herod, you know, somebody was dying around him all the time. So blood and all that, you know, it, you know it, for us, it's just, it's, it's difficult to even talk about. It's difficult to imagine. But with them, oh man, almost everyday thing. All you got to do is just cross Herod or Herodias and you're headless. So they bring his head. She skips. You're talking about messed up. Brother, you sure wouldn't want to marry Salome. And if you do, don't go to sleep. <laughs> she skips to the guard, the executioner. She gets John's head. And she runs back over to her mom as though she just went to the king's table, got some of his choicest meats and foods and was bringing it to her for her to eat. And they do this to the man of God. But God got it. The time went on and Caligula became the emperor. And Philip, Salome's Daddy died. All right? Herodias' real husband, Philip the tea trench, dies. Caligula, emperor of Rome, places another man in office. 
in Philip's place, but the new man also got a new title. The new man's name was Agrippa. And they gave him the title king. Josephus says that when uh, Herodias heard that Agrippa was called king and her husband Antipas, Herod is called Tetrach. She got mad because she wanted to be called queen. So she talks her husband into going to Rome to try and get her husband's title changed. And she said, we will spare no expense. Says, for what better way can we spend our money, this is a quote, than in obtaining the kingdom. So she goes and tries to change Caligula's mind. But, follow me on this, I'm, I'm done. Uh, Agrippa hears about her plan. And then Agrippa accuses them, sends word, and he makes an accusation that Herod was trying to uh, do something other than just try to get his title changed. And Caligula, the emperor, believed Agrippa Amen. and took Herod and banished him to a place called Gaul. And took all of his money and all of his power and said, now there you will stay until you die. So in the end, Herodias and Herod lost their kingdom. They lost their fortune and dragged out a weary existence in a faraway place called Gaul. And uh, I told you I would say something nice about Herodias because I want to be fair. There was one shining moment of, of uh, greatness and she showed her a greatness. Herodias Interestingly enough, married to Philip, married Agrippa, the truth is Herodias was married to Philip and married Herod Antipas. Herodias was King Agrippa's sister. And since Herodias was Agrippa's sister, Caligula said, you don't have to give up your money and you don't have to go and be banished with your husband. Now he's done. Don't even bring that up. He's done. But you can stay and, and live. And she, uh, she said, no. Um, <clears throat> says, I have, let me read her quote. She said, Thou indeed, O emperor, artist, I mean, actest after a magnificent manner, and as become thyself. And what thou offerest me, but the love which I have for my husband hinders uh, me from partaking of the favor of thy gift. For it is not just that I, who have been his partner in his prosperity, should forsake him in his misfortune. And so Herodias accompanied Herod to exile. I hear some of you say, <laughs> I hear somebody say, hmm. <laughs> I mean, sister would say, bye. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, and if ever, if ever that was proof that sin brings its own punishment, that proof lies in the story of Herod. It was an ill day when Herod first seduced Herodias, but it was an ill day before then. From that act of infidelity came the murder of John and in the end disaster in which he lost all except the woman who loved him and ruined him. John got in trouble for standing on God's word. To stand on God's word is not a guarantee that every day will be sunny. It's not a guarantee that things will always go your way. But it is, however, a guarantee that the Lord will not forsake you. And that the Lord will keep you. And that you will end up on top. Jesus says, fear not them who can destroy your body. But after that, there's no more they can do. Fear him who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. It is so important as never before that we allow our lives to be guided by the word of God. Anything you gotta go out of, outside of God's word to get is not worth having. Anyone is not worth having. For the word of God is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our pathway. It makes wise the simple. It blesses your life. Stay with God. Serve the Lord. Obey his word. And you'll be glad you did. We're trying to figure out how to stop the gun violence. How to stop all this stuff. What are we going to do with our young men and all this stuff? Let's put them into sports. Let's put them into this, let's put them into that. Let's give them the scouts. Let's give them this, that, and the other. Let's let them sing. The Bible says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God. We offer now everything but the Bible. And until we go back to the Bible, until then, you can forget it. It takes the word of God. You need to be saved. You need to give your heart to Jesus Christ. I want to say something to you. Just for the record. There is not a Herod in this room. There's not a person in this room that Jesus is not speaking to. If you were, you wouldn't be in here. John didn't collide with Herod at church or in the synagogue. It was in his palace when he sent for him for entertainment. You're here. The devil didn't give you a mind to come to church. The devil, Satan didn't get you up. It was God the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart. Come to me. Somebody in here today needs to be saved. Somebody needs to know who Jesus is. Someone needs to come. The altar is open and give your heart to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Time is swiftly running out on me. I preached longer than I intended today, but I had something to say that needed to be said. This message is filled with Encouragements and warnings, both political 
as well as scriptural and spiritual. Oh God, save me. Oh God, deliver me.